You know the world out there? The way that it is? That's the way they want it. This is not by accident. The Humanist Being Presents When Humanists Attack Roger Kimmel Smith here for When Humanists Attack, the program that asks the musical question, wouldn't it be fun to try for once actually steering away from the oncoming iceberg of planetary catastrophe? On this episode, Exodus from Texas. As the political and legal environment in the Lone Star State becomes inhospitable to transgender children, one couple named Vera and Jeremiah, parents of one such child named Pearl, decided to pick up stakes and move to the Yankee North. Our Chris West interviewed them in their new home state of Vermont. When Humanist Attack is brought to you by The Humanist Being, a nonprofit religious organization. Uh, Chris West is the president of The Humanist Being. And tell me, Chris, what, what's happening with the organization these days? So it's been some very exciting times here, Roger. Um, first of all, I spent uh, last weekend at the American Atheist Convention um, in Phoenix, and we had a table there for the first time. Um, and nice. at the table, we got the opportunity to speak to, to hundreds of uh, like-minded people from all over the country. And uh, we're just starting to float a question to people in general, which is, uh, first of all, <laughs> what grade would you give society as you see it right now? Like, uh, how do you think things are going? And the second one is if you had an opportunity <laughs> to come up with a solution for a, a problem you see in the world using secular humanist principles, like the 12 commitments that we we propose here at the, the humanist being, what would you come up with? And, and people came up with the most beautiful and thoughtful and interesting solutions to, uh, to things that they see as what's wrong with the society. Yeah. Um, another world is possible. That's what we're proposing. We don't have the answers. We don't even have uh, armies of people ready to implement this right now. But what we do have is some meetings, uh, talking, uh, discussing what that vision can look like so we can start coalescing around these and, and come up with ways of making these things happen in the real world. The humanist being has started using one social media app, in particular with great success, and that app is Meetup. You started the meetup group uh, for the Burlington, Vermont area, because that's where you live and you you know had been and you are having in-person meetings, but also virtual meetings. Yep. Uh, we found that the, uh, the meetup format um, just makes it really easy to communicate. People can plan with it. They can look at what we have coming up in the future. It's a, a great calendar. It also, you can say you're attending or send questions about the meeting, about what's going to be going on, whether it's virtual or in person. And because a lot of these meetings have been virtual and people have been kind of trained through the, the pandemic to to communicate virtually, um, we've been able to get uh, people from all over the country to participate in our our meetings and our programs. Internationally, too. Isn't there that one person from Moscow who keeps showing up? Yeah, yeah. We have a, a woman in Moscow who shows up regularly to our meetings. So, um, the the, the most popular, it seems, of the offerings that the humanist being is giving through meetup.com is the Impossible Conversations Club in which we practice street epistemology. Yes. Can you unpack that, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. So when we're interacting with people, uh, one of the things that we're interested in just as humanists and, and people is why people believe what they believe. What they believe is is interesting as a concept, but really why are they convinced that this is true? Um, because we're having a crisis in what we agree on what's true. So we need to start unpacking for each other. I mean, I, I need my assumptions um, challenged as well. And uh, after um, having a conversation, a pleasant, a cooperative, non-confrontational discussion, 
uh, we can uncover through the application of some Socratic uh, method why you believe what you believe and whether your confidence in that belief uh, stands up to just some reasonable scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, epistemology, uh, I understand, is the philosophy of knowledge but uh, also how you arrive at knowledge and, you know, maybe how you come to decide that you know something, uh, uh, you know, or so what falls short of knowledge, but seems like knowledge. So there's this funny area of belief, which is right. like where so, we spend most of the time. You know? Right. Uh, we can get deep into the philosophy here for sure. And uh, it's it's true. The question, the famous philosopher's question, who am I? Um, uh, comes into play uh, is is there a a actual reality that we all can can point to and our point of view is that yes there's there is a reality and that reality is something that that we test with various methods and uh, our confidence on whether those methods uh, produce reliable results or not is kind of what we're trying to get at because a lot of the beliefs we have, we took on before we had critical thinking skills when we were children, for instance. If you have a belief and, and you go through student epistemology and that belief holds up, man, you've defended the uh, reason why you have that belief. Right. So it's part of our philosophical um, point of view here at, at The Humanist Being. We believe that we should be skeptical people and, and it's a, a tool for skepticism. Uh, and to apply skepticism without attacking the person's belief. We're not interested in the belief itself. We're interested in why you believe it's true. Um, yeah, not in the belief, but what is the what is the mechanism that makes you believe something and makes you confident in that belief? It, it really is quite a cunning, you know, set of tools. Also on the meetup, we're having monthly meetings of a very different kind, but also quite heady. Almost a, a skeptical approach towards oneself and one's own personality. Can you explain this? What the self therapy group is doing? So that's a very interesting way to put it. I, I like it. So one of the pillars of our, once again the humanist being's point of view is that good mental health is important for everyone, and we understand that um, access to mental health care can be difficult. And we found a uh, well. A vetted psychological framework, and it's called the internal family systems. Uh, it isn't for everybody. Anybody with a serious type of pathology with a real mental illness should be working with a professional, but there are types of therapy that you can do either in small groups or on your own with people who are just peers, and this is one of those systems. So we're we're learning how to understand uh, the nomenclature of that system um, and how to apply it to ourselves. Hmm. It's, it's been a rough couple of years, and uh, we really need to be able to have access to good mental health care. And we're supporting each other in this, this journey. This is all peer support, right? We're all just regular people reading this book, trying to understand how it can help us. Fascinating. So these are all three programs that, uh, that we are offering through, through meetup.com, the Humanist Being Burlington group, and now we've started a second meetup group for Brooklyn, yeah, New York City. Yeah, we've got one in Brooklyn now, so uh, we're expanding. Oh, so we're on Discord as well. Yep. You've been doing some of our uh, Impossible Conversation Club stuff there, and that platform is becoming more and more active. So, And it's a great place to to have meetings and discussions and things. And of course, the humanisbeing.org uh, is our website which we're trying to uh, keep pace with the growth of our organization all right um so tell me about the the interview that we have for this episode and the and the couple vera and jeremiah whom you engaged yeah so um early last year um my wife met vera uh, on a transparent call transparent is a monthly meeting that Outright Vermont, uh, an LGBTQ support and community organization holds for the parents of transgender non-binary children. Vera and her husband, Jeremiah, were living in Texas, um, in Austin, Texas, and they were appalled at the uh, laws that were being passed by the Texas legislature and signed into law by the Texas governor which uh, basically would make them criminals for providing 
uh, gender affirming care that was uh, prescribed by a licensed uh, doctor. So instead of waiting around for things to get worse, they decided to move up here to Vermont and actually just kind of left everything in their house, bought a pop-up camper and just drove away from Texas. Man, um, refugee and- style. Real refugee style. They were talking about, you know, the possibility that the Texas authorities would take their kids away. Um, they're not the only family, by the way, that we've heard of who have left Texas for Vermont. There's a, a, a small stream of them. So this is a phenomenon. And these people were just camping in a state camp, a state park for a month at a time. And we said, you know what? We've got a pretty big yard here. Um, why don't you come and park here? At least you can use our our services. You can use our bathroom, our shower, our kitchen. Um, and so they lived in our, our driveway for almost two months last mm-hmm. summer. They originally wanted to buy right away, but because of the change in the market in Texas, they ended up uh, finding a rental here in in the area uh, just for the year. And since then, they found a, a home um, after, of course, the interview had happened, uh, but they they bought a home and they're going to be moving into that. Oh, great. Um, they're really settling in. I saw them today. Um, it was uh, Pearl's uh, uh, 10th birthday. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so let's let's hear that interview. So welcome, uh, Vera and Jeremiah. Thank you for taking some time out to talk to me yeah, about, totally. um, about your experience, mm. about your travels um tell me a little bit about you just just background information like you know you guys where you from um how did you meet how long have you been together when did you have kids just just tell me a little bit about yourselves um so we met in high school in cypress texas um which is uh, it's a suburb of houston um northwest yeah the northwest side of houston um and we were friends through like uh art and photography um and then we started dating shortly after we both graduated high school um because we moved to similar parts of houston uh while vera was going to college and i was just working um and didn't know anybody so we started hanging out more and then she decided that i was tolerable (laughs) So uh, here we are, t- twenty years later. Nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. So we're yeah. I don't know. Class of class of th- two thousand two. Bobcat fight never dies. <laughs> is our slogan. Um, yeah. I don't know. So we we have been hanging around each other this whole time. Um, we moved from the Houston area to Central Texas around the Austin area in two thousand five. Got married in 2009, had a kid in 2010, had another kid in 2013. Um, yeah, that's that's our origin story. I so tell, <laughs> tell me a little bit about your your personal views on life. Hmm. You know, where do you sit on the political spectrum? A little bit about the community that you were a member of. Oh, right, yeah. So we, I mean, I grew up, um, you know, like Lucy Goosey Unitarian, you know, it was never like you know, politically to the left, religiously kind of nowhere, um, you know, very like live and live and let live kind of thing. Uh, that, I guess wasn't so much the case for you. You had more structure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was raised Methodist mm-hmm. um, and my parents were s- slightly more conservative than moderate, but mm-hmm. um, they would never admit to that. <laughs> um, and... It was in high school when I realized that religion wasn't for me and that uh, right-wing politics weren't for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the folks at our high school that bought into those things, I didn't really care for. Um, Not necessarily religiously speaking, but like politically... uh, they were all assholes. Yeah, the no asshole policy. Yeah. A loose, a loose no asshole policy, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> you know, you can't you can't avoid them all, but um but yeah. you don't have to be friends with them. Yeah. When when I realized that I was able to 
distance myself from those people that I was allowed to do that, um, you know, my life got a lot better. It's often what we talk to uh, when we talk to people who grew up as a non-traditional type of person in a school mm -hmm. and we're talking to them, they're calling a crisis line for instance. Mm -hmm. We often tell them it gets better, mm -hmm. right? At some point you get to decide who you can hang out with yep. and at that point you will create a family of people around you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is the expectation. It's what we've seen with most people. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, yeah, and, and not to say that, like, I was, like, wildly unhappy or, like, felt unsafe or anything, but I definitely, like, had more peace of mind when I was able to divorce those sit people in those situations. Because mm -hmm. you played sports and stuff. Like, you were in you yeah. know, basketball and football and track, track yeah. was, I guess, middle school. Yeah. Um, yeah, so being surrounded by, like, jocks... Uh, made me unhappy <laughs> socially speaking yeah like socially sports who doesn't like sports right yeah like i enjoyed playing the sports, like sports but like in between like being on the field versus like off the field like uh like those are kids people that i would never hang out with yeah it's a very well understood milieu mm -hmm. social milieu that is often anti a lot of things mm -hmm. yeah right? mm -hmm. it certainly is okay with making fun of people the the famous locker room talk yeah that we are all familiar with right um comes from locker rooms and the locker room starts in middle school yeah you know goes to high school so i get that and it's always nice to be at a point where you finally get to realize i get to decide who I spend my time with <laughs> right yeah that's a nice yeah. uh, and you nice kind of uh, pivoted from sports to artsy stuff right is that one thing yeah things um, felt different to you at that point yeah i'd always been interested in like arts uh and music and stuff but uh when i realized that my social needs weren't being met on the football field that's when i uh pivoted i, I quit sports and um started taking photography mm. for better or worse you know, <laughs> and, you know the, those were my people more so than, you know, the, the kids I played football and basketball with. Yeah. Classic middle school, high school, safe space for non-conforming people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Theater. Yeah. Photography. The dark room. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. Um, so you have two children. Mm -hmm. uh, they're now nine and 12, twelve yeah. Yeah, right? And uh, you're now living in the frigid north uh, east of the country. We're in Vermont. Yeah. We're, we're in Essex, Vermont, uh, near Burlington. Uh, tell us a little about um, why you felt compelled to leave your lifetime home in Texas. Yeah, sure. So we, we came to understand that our youngest is trans when they were four. Um, Assigned male at birth, transitioned to she, her around that time, um, which actually went fine. I mean, at the time, right, all our conversations with ourselves and with our family, everybody was just like, well, you know, good thing you're in Austin, you know, like good thing you're school supportive and, you know, family supportive. The neighborhood was great. I mean, we really weren't under any kind of duress or, you know, I mean, everything was was fine. I think at that time um, we thought well, it's a shame our, our kid is probably going to grow up and not want to go to college here. Like, our kid's probably going to grow up, turn 18, and move to another state at that point. And mm -hmm. we'll just deal with that when that happens, you know. But until then, like, we're, you know, we'll be, we'll be fine because we're in Austin and our family's supportive and we have wonderful neighbors and a really great school with a really great principal. Um, and that's really kind of, you know, where, where I left it until, you know, I guess legislatively things were ramping up and we really started to think well we might want to make a break for it you know we'll make a clean break when our youngest finishes fifth grade and our oldest finishes eighth grade we'll make a clean break and we might leave texas for like a nearby state that has some protections in place um what you know. were you thinking that might be i mean i know in and around texas and new mexico mm -hmm. is like the most liberal state bordering texas where were, where were you we love we took a trip to new mexico to scope that out mm -hmm. um we we were talking about colorado for a little bit um and we do have some friends who wound up there yeah i don't think we have anybody who wound up in new mexico 
Uh, I mean, everybody's just scattered. You know, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, and we took a trip to Portland. Um, I don't know if that was ever, like... In the in the running for places to move. No, but at that point I don't Oregon? think we thought. Yeah. yeah. At that point I don't think we thought. I mean, I wasn't thinking Exodus at that point. Yeah. Definitely by true. by the time we went to New Mexico two summers ago, I was like, let's scope it out and see if we like click with the you know check the vibe out or whatever. Um, we went to Chicago. Mm-hmm. I don't think we were thinking about moving then either. We were just you know poking around. Yeah, that was shortly after. Uh, Pearl had transitioned. Yeah. That's um, true. But that was an exciting trip because uh, some high school friends, one of them, um, uh, turns out he's trans as well. You know, like he figured that out in college. Mm. Um, so it, it, I think that was the first time that Pearl had met like a trans adult. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, we had a trans friend in Portland too. That we oh, yeah, with. yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it was great seeing him just because... Uh, as like a, a role model for Pearl to look up to. Like, yeah. I don't think Pearl's ever felt been under duress mm-hmm. because of their transness. But, uh, I think seeing like a successful adult, um, who's happy socially and everything. Uh, I don't know. I thought that was really cool for them to, to witness. Yeah. 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 So we get to 2021, yeah. October. Yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah, pretty much. 2020, October 2020, I think, is when we really started to come to understand that we needed to leave. You know, I mean, the the timeline just keeps, keep kept getting cut in half, you know, so whatever. So expecting to leave when you're, yeah, we were like, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll leave, yeah, they'll leave us. And then we're like, oh, we might all go in three years, you know, uh, make a clean break in three years. And then we were like, oh, we'll stay um, around the ledge session. We were like, oh, we'll stay through the end of the school year. You know, Mm -hmm. we'll let them finish out at that point. We're talking about finishing third grade and sixth grade. um, And then we'll move. Um, And then, you know, with the with the directive or whatever that came out in February, we were like, we we need to already be gone. I mean, at that point, we had friends under investigation, you know, and I was just waiting for a knock on the door because I had testified at the Capitol. My name's like public record. Um, the folks that I knew that were under investigation had done the same thing, and so I thought, well, are they working down a list or what? You know, um, they just take the visitor list from that session, and yeah. I mean, they could. You're you know, easy I'm right there. Uh, contact. Yeah, right? I didn't use like a you know pseudonym or anything. I was just, you know, so yeah. I mean, basically, the timeline just kept getting getting cut in half. So I, when we were in that moment, before we were in full blown panic mode, and we knew we were probably going to move at the end of the school year. We had narrowed it down. You know, there's only kind of like seven states on the list um, that people kind of consider like safer. Um, And Vermont was appealing because unlike California or Oregon or Colorado, like I didn't want to deal with droughts, uh, (laughs) droughts and wildfires. We deal with that in Texas. Um, So I didn't want to uproot everything and leave everything behind only to have it all, you know, burn down or have to leave again. So climate-wise, long-term projections, Vermont felt like a safer bet. Proximity to Canada sure doesn't hurt. Um, because again, we've now, we've now seen our timeline shrink and shrink and shrink. And so to me, like I'm not planning a move to Canada, right? But I wasn't planning a move to Vermont three years ago. And so, um, you know, the easier, you know, the more back doors we can have for ourselves, that's kind of where we're at now. Yeah. You know, it'd be nice to look back on this in six years and be like, oh, you know, can you believe we thought we might have to go to Canada? You know, I would love that. Like, I would love to wake up one day and just think, you know, that was silly. We thought we had to leave our whole country. Um, but I, I think that's a less likely scenario in six years. Like, So tell me a little bit about this law, because although we're talking about it like we understand <laughs> what happened, uh, there was um, uh, Paxton, yeah. the attorney general, made a... Uh, a recommendation mm-hmm. that uh, that parent that children who are seeking gender affirming care uh, be, maybe be followed and and prosecuted mm-hmm. because of that. So tell me uh, a little yeah. about how that that developed because it then became it was a, a as far as I understand it mm-hmm. it was a, an advice that the attorney general gave to mm-hmm. the governor that then became he doubled down on. Yeah, I mean it's it's really really frightening and I think a lot of people don't understand this and even. 
even I kind of don't understand it, but like, you know, my time in the Capitol, right? These bills come up, they go to committee, you could testify in front of the committee, explain why this shouldn't be under consideration, hope they don't push it through. And that's kind of like the avenue you think of when you, you know, have seen Schoolhouse Rock before, you know, like that's how things happen. And so there were bills under consideration to make affirming your tr trans child, child abuse, right? So I testified on those bills and those bills ultimately failed, which, you know, to the great relief of many, right? The great consternation of many also, I guess. So, you know, we really thought the Texas legislature meets every two years. Uh, we thought we'd sort of get like a year off to regroup and rest or whatever. Um, but meanwhile, behind the scenes, um, Paxton wrote to the head of um, CPS to ask whether or not affirming trans children could be considered child abuse under our existing laws, right? So not writing a new law, there's no new law, like it's the same laws we've always had against abusing children, but wanted to check if maybe under those laws, folks could be prosecuted. Um, and the answer was sure, you know, maybe, like, you know, we, we, we wouldn't rule it out, you know? And so he bounced that over to the governor and the governor doubled down on it. And so now there is no new law, it's illegal, it has been illegal and will continue to be illegal to abuse children in Texas, thankfully, right? I work in early childhood. Um, and I've dealt with CPS, you know, through my mandated reporting there. Um, but now through this lens, through this, this directive, um, affirming your trans child, providing um, any, any form of medical care uh, is now within that, within that realm of possibly being child abuse under existing laws. So, um, so instead of needing a new law, a redefinition of what Yeah, I was like, let's is, just reinterpret this. Like, right. let's just, let's just, you know, really pick through it. You know, could this be considered abuse? Sure, you know, and now it is, and now people are under investigation. And worse than that, too, you know, they, the, um, the investigators typically have some degree of creative control, um, some degree of, you know, through their training, they can interpret these, these calls in and sort of triage them and figure out what needs immediate handling and what, you know, what might not, and they can, they can talk through and um, figure out what needs to be addressed immediately. And these cases are being held completely separately. They're being held, treated as like, do not pass go, do not collect $200, but investigate the family and don't put anything in writing. Um, so it's, it's really, really frightening. Um, there's, you know, stuff has happened since then. Um, um, PFLAG and the ACLU and other organizations have, you know, pushed, pushed back. There's been a lot of stuff I totally don't understand <laughs> happening in courts. Um, and as of now, um, P flag families, members of um, P flag national, um, are currently protected from investigations, which is really important for, for people to understand. Yeah. It, it costs fifty dollars to get a family membership to P flag, and if you are a member, um, you are you are protected under their lawsuit of not being investigated un, under these terms until the yeah. lawsuit moves forward and some kind of decision is made. This is kind of like right. a, yeah. a pause. It's really yeah. I mean, it's really just it's like the worst game of ping pong ever. Like right. you just can't you know. It's hard to keep up with, for sure. Yeah. Um, everything that Vera just said, like, was way over my head. Uh, I couldn't have even began to explain all the nonsense that they're, like, trying to pull to endanger our families. Yeah. Um, so do me a favor. Run through a scenario. You're still living in Texas. Mm -hmm. The PFAG thing isn't working. Mm -hmm. uh, you are on a list for having testified. Mm -hmm in front of the state house, mm -hmm. making you a shortlist for the AG, mm -hmm. the attorney general, or other people mm -hmm. to come to you and say, well, you testified, we know you have a trans mm -hmm. kid, what are you doing? Yeah. And so, so go run through a worst case scenario, why, why you actually felt it was necessary to flee your lifetime home. Well, that's what, I mean, that's what was really, really, that was probably the worst part of all of this, because in the course of, you know, the last ledge session, there was, there were all kinds of bills. I mean, they were really just pulling pulling all the stops, right? So there, there's this, the sports bills and, and all kinds of other things, bills looking at medical providers, bills looking at, you know, locker rooms and, you know, all the things, birth certificates. Um, and I, I would go and testify on those. Um, and I didn't, I, I talked to the kids about the sports one because they're not athletes. And I was like, you know, this is, a, you know, it's important for them to know what's going on. It's important for them to know where I'm going and what I'm talking about, but I don't want to frighten them. And so I thought, well, I can talk to them about the sports things. They're not athletes, and they'll think it's so silly that anybody would think, right, that, you know, one, you know, 
one set of features would automatically perform better and that, you know, that it's not fair to play against people, you know, who are built a different way. Like, they'll, they'll just laugh that off. And they did, you know. Um, but when it came down to, like, the abuse bills and stuff, I didn't want them to know. I mean, it's not developmentally appropriate for my children to, to know what's being said about them. Um, and I really thought I could just keep it from them. It could just be, like, part of my, my adult private life that I, that I go have these fights and I have these conversations and they can just stay home and not worry about it. But when, um, when that directive came out, we had to sit down with them and, and tell them um, that somebody might come to their school and that, and that they might pull them out of class and that if they do, don't be frightened. They're, they're, they're doing their job. They're nice people who are looking out for children, which we all believe in doing. But that in this specific case, it's important not to answer their questions. It's important to ask for a lawyer. Like I'm telling my eight-year-old, don't cooperate <laughs> to the extent, you know, like you can answer their questions once your lawyer's there. Right. You know, we're looking at getting a separate lawyer for our children and a separate lawyer for us. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's like it just boggles the mind, you know, going, you know, one month I'm there with my like very cute 11-year-old who's there to testify on why kids of all genders should get to play sports together, you know. And then one month later, I'm sitting at this literal table, um, you know, telling them, hey, like, here's a card, you know, it has, you know, a, a law office's phone number on it, you would hand this to them. And you would just tell them that you need your lawyer before you can speak to them. You know, that's awful. I could never, I yeah. mean, I could never as a child have complied or complied with not complying. You know, I mean, it's, it's. It's really, really awful how, how quickly it happened. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, there's many, many children in Texas doing this. You know, we, we all had to sit down with our kids and really level with them. You know, that's not never anything I wanted to level with them on. Like, I feel like we should have left sooner. If I would have known, I would have left sooner, so I wouldn't have had to have that conversation, right. you know. Yeah, what a terrible conversation <laughs> to, have, to have with your child, you yeah. know. Um, the ACLU of Texas uh, had a Zoom call, like explaining all the uh, nuances of the directive, how it didn't have any legal standing. But that that doesn't matter. But that it doesn't matter. <laughs> like it's horrible. Um, and, you know, gave us the language to go to our kids and say, hey, if this happens, you know, tell them you need a lawyer. And then... Um, I think there was a, a list of lawyers that were volunteering their time for, uh, you know, families like ours, uh, which is amazing um, that they were doing that. But, you know, it's like terrifying. You know, we just yeah. want our kids to be happy, safe and healthy, you know, and it wasn't possible to check off all those boxes. No, I mean, there's there's no future for us in Texas. and. I were, you know, I feel bad sometimes, you know, because it's like, well, you know, by us leaving or, you know, are we making it that much more dangerous for the people who are left, you know? Um, a lot of people are talking about standing their ground and putting up a fight and setting that example for their kids, which I really respect and admire, you know? Um, you know, we just had to bounce, you know? Like, yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not here to say, I mean, people move for way dumber reasons than this. You know? like, people, people move for no reason at all, you know? So... You know, for us, like, yes, our family's all in Texas, but our family's not all from Texas. You know, your mom moved to Texas from right. Illinois. My mom moved to Texas, from, you know, as a child from Virginia. You know, like, people come and go. Yeah. Um, and so on, on one hand, I kind of look at it like that, like, you know, what's the big deal? We moved. You know, yeah. on the other hand, I look at it and I'm like, we don't know anybody here. <laughs> like, and we moved under duress. We moved under duress, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's, um, there's a wonderful refugee population here outside of Burlington, you know, and these are people who fled war zones and stuff, you know, like we, I kept my job, we got to bring most of our belongings, we got to keep one of our pets, two of our pets, you know, two whole pets out of our seven got to come with us. So like, is it really that bad? You know, we kept one of our cars. <laughs> and so it's really, it's, it's kind of a mind fuck, you know, like, we're, like, am I a refugee? Am I just displaced? Am I just, did I just move? You know, like, what is this? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't really know what to do with it you know, per personally, you know, we're like expats. What would have happened in your worst case scenario if, for instance, mm. your your transgender child was at school, got pulled out, mm. and you find out that they 
in some way incriminate you mm. um, what what did what was the the script that you saw in your mind that might happen under that situation what's the worst case scenario I don't know I mean children haven't been this is this is a thing that comes up because the CPS um, uh, D Texas FPS, Department of Family Protective Services, um, ha have like sort of committee meetings where they take public comment. So, you know, folks like us are showing up in mass, you know, kind of telling how it is and explaining their what they've gone through and what they'll continue to go through. Um, and I don't know, one of, one of the guys, you know, pulled someone aside and was like, you know, you're doing all this for nothing. We're, we haven't even removed any kids. You know, like, like what, like this is big fusses over nothing. Like, no kid's been taken away. You know, you're overreacting. Right, like, like just yeah. the, like the level of fuckery, like just the gaslighting is is horrific. Yeah. Like, to even to even say that is, I mean, it, it's just, it's such an abomination. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, would I, it, you know, in the scenario you laid out, like, would we be the ones whose kids gets taken away? Probably not. Like, maybe we're not that special, you know? Like, maybe our kid gets to stay, and maybe we just have a file on us in some drawer in some office, you know? I mean, I literally, I mean, I don't know, you know? But I, I can tell you, a lot of damage is done, you know? A lot of, a lot of trauma is there regardless, and, and the cruelty is the point. I mean, they're not, they're not doing it to take kids away. They're doing it to, like, hurt people. They're doing it to make it impossible to be to be trans and um, to uphold you know whatever status quo they think exists that, that doesn't. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we would you know we would we would have our lawyer. They would have their lawyer. You know, we would like dot our eyes and cross our t's and do what we have to do. You know, would we like pull them out of bed in the middle of the night and throw them in the car and take them to the next state over? Like I don't know. I mean, at some point, probably. Yeah. Like I don't I don't know what. I mean, it would have to be worst case scenario after worst case. Like, they would have to build on each other, you know, to lead us to that point. Um, and it's really hard to imagine. Because um, there, there have been many families under investigation. And, you know, what they were going through, you know, I'm sure hasn't been all public. You know, I haven't been privy to, to all of it. But everybody has an exit plan. I mean, yeah. even, even the people who are, are staying and fighting and, and leading by example and doing everything that, you know, we just couldn't do, they have escape plans too. The people I really feel for, there's a lot of people who just can't leave. Um, they might be caregivers for, for elderly parents. They might have a custody situation with another child that they would have to leave behind in Texas if they, if they left. Um, there's people who have their entire livelihoods built there. They have their own businesses that, they, that they're running. So, you know, people would lose, uh, you know, like the business folds and all these other people lose their jobs when we leave, you know, because yeah. we're, we're, we're regular people, right? We're everywhere. So... Um, you know, in, in my case, you know, like whole Girl Scout troop lost their troop leader when I left, you know, cis kids, mostly cis kids, <laughs> you know, um, you know, you lock up, pedi you know, you lock up our kid's pediatrician and it's mostly cis kids that suffer, you know, like, yeah, he has trans patients, but he had a hell of a lot more cisgender patients. Right. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the damage will be widespread. It already is widespread. So we still have to see how this flushes out. I mean, like yeah. you said, the Texas legislature is only there for two years. We're coming into another legislative session yeah. in 2023. Yeah. And we can see whether or not this push mm -hmm. uh, to codify, you know, not giving trans kids the type of care that the American... The Medical Association, the mm. American Society of Pediatricians, mm. all of the major um, organizations that deal with, you know, the care of transgender yeah. children, say that this is the care they should be getting. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we'll have to see how it how it flushes out in Texas. Tell me a little about about the the exodus. Uh, you, guys, <laughs> oh, God. you guys left Texas in. Uh, July, June? June. We, left, June. we left our home. We locked the door and walked away on June 6th. We have a pop-up camper. It's, it's functionally a covered wagon. It doesn't even have a hard top. It just whoops open and it's all canvas. And we, we bummed around um, across the country. We wound up in Vermont. I think we got to Vermont in that in July, beginning of July. So we bummed around for about a month. Yeah. Um, and then once we got here... Uh, we continued camping. We didn't. We didn't find our own indoor place to live until August thirty first. So um, we we lived outdoors for eighty nine days um, before we 
had another door to lock and unlock of our very own. Yeah, um, some of that, so, I don't know, it's kind of tricky, like, so we listed our house back in Texas, we owned our, our home, um, and we listed it expecting it to sell based on market trends that weekend, um, but it didn't sell until like two or three months later, so. Yeah, you guys left yeah. the week the market on housing it, yeah. changed from yeah. Yeah, like, everyone spending 50% more on a house and yep. they're buying them right away to right. a pause. Yeah, interest yeah. rates interest rates went, rates went up. Um, houses in our neighborhood have been selling just, I mean, just absolutely obscene amounts of money. And a lot of folks had put their houses on the market, you know, um, and they were getting snatched up regardless. And I think that when the market rates went up in, it had to have been late May, um, whatever investors, whoever it was that was buying these houses just decided to not for a minute, just wait and see what, see what's going to happen. So we didn't, our house didn't close till October 5th. Yeah. Um, which we never would have anticipated, you know. Yeah, we would have planned our, our trip a little <laughs> bit differently. <laughs> you left I don't know. Early, right? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, we yeah. would have. Yeah, I mean, we we would have said fuck the school year, and we would have just left in as soon as we could have packed our stuff. Yeah. You know, we t we took sort of a we worked really hard, you know, to pull things together at our house, um, and you know, freshen up the paint, and, like you know, pack and store everything properly, and um, but we we could have, should have started sooner and moved quicker and just left we should have left at spring break we should have left in march yeah. if we would have left in march we'd be sitting on a pile of money and we would own a home in vermont you know right um, and we wouldn't have been camping in your driveway for two months <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is uh, magical <laughs> great it's a magical I mean, experience yeah. um hmm. tell me a little about uh, how the how your transition is going how you guys um are experiencing moving to Vermont, how are the kids doing, how is your your new life here in Vermont going? Except for, of course, the amazement every time there's a it's snowflake. Snowing right, <laughs> it's snowing right now. It is. It is. It's magical. Um, so I think for Vera and I, like, professionally, not much has changed. You know, like, uh, Vera works remotely and I'm a cook, so I was confident that I could find a job, you know, cooking anywhere. And I did. Um, so that aspect, like, I wasn't worried about that as, like, a financial burden. Um, and then just finding a place and not knowing the area very well, that was a little, uh, I was a little anxious about that. You know, we ended up next to uh, a bunch of college dorm rooms, and <laughs> it gets pretty rowdy sometimes on the weekends. But other than that, I think so you know. Those Catholic boys at St. Michael's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very nice, very yeah. nice children. Very um, upstanding citizens. Yeah. Um, uh, the kids are, I think, doing okay-ish. Uh, mostly, they've made some friends at school. It's it has been a huge adjustment, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, just because they left everything they knew back home, um, but they're able to connect with their old friends, you know, on, you know, uh, messenger chats every yeah, once in a while or a phone call and they'll play video games and stuff. Um, but there isn't a ton of stuff like immediately around where we are, um, you know, for them to go explore, um, you know, cause we live right next to a very busy street. Mm -hmm. Um, and there aren't any playgrounds around or other kids that we know of. Yeah, their schools are, are far. They go past many other schools before hitting the schools that they're assigned to and within our district because it's, it's kind of cut out a little wonky. So um, we haven't met any of their... I mean, they have friends at school, but we haven't, like, met or met any of them. I'm sure there are a lot yeah. of other people, you know. Yeah, there's... You guys are literally on the ass end of Colchester, right? Yeah. There's, a, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's this whole community of Colchester over yeah. by the schools where the kids are at, but it's... You know, a half hour drive almost. Yeah, they take there. the bus. I mean, yeah. I just pop them on the bus, pop them off the bus. I don't know what they do all day or, you know, who they're with. Everybody seems great. They're, um, you know, all the conversations we've had with, like, school administrators and the teachers and the counselor have been wonderful. You know, so I know mm -hmm. their needs are being met. I know they're getting a good education. I know they're getting settled. And I also know every kid has been jerked around so much in the last couple of years with the pandemic um, that they're focusing really heavily on social emotional learning and socialization skills, and they're dealing with a lot of behavioral stuff. 
you know, kind of regardless. And yeah. so, you know, as awkward as it is to get copy pasted from Texas to Vermont in the middle of middle school, in my son's case, um, I think all the kids are dealing with some weirdness, some kind of weirdness. regardless, yeah. you know, and actually, um, I did the math. Our son is going to go to five schools in five years. Because he went from fifth grade at elementary and then sixth grade at middle school in Austin, seventh grade here. We're going to move. He's going to go to another middle school for eighth grade, and then he's going to go on to high school. Yeah. And that's five schools in five years. So yeah. we're in the middle of that stretch right now, and I think he's going to be like a master of it. <laughs> By the time he gets to high school, he'll be like really good at being the new kid. Yeah. He'll just he'll just stride right in. Well, the know? nice thing about high school yeah. is a lot of the kids are new kids. Yeah. You have more than one school emptying into that school. It's a it's the moment when. The first moment, like you were talking about earlier, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. when you get to redefine who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? You get to choose who you're hanging out with at lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not in the way you have in middle school yeah. or elementary school. So that's that's good. And you're moving towns, right? You, you guys have, have uh, found a house in Essex, which is, we could walk to where your house is going to be. It would yeah. take us about 15, 20 minutes to walk there. Yeah. But, um, so you're, you're changing schools, but... Mm -hmm. You're you're not changing environments in a, in a yeah yeah right? you're going to be in the the Chittenden area mm -hmm. Chittenden you know county mm -hmm. you're going to be in the 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 warm you know gay trans LGBTQ mm -hmm. friendly place so success in that way yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and we I mean we made a lot of connections. I think what I'm trying to do now, maybe, you know, whatever to make myself feel better about what I've done to my kids, is, you know, I don't think every egg needs to be in the school basket, right? Like, you know, the kids spend a lot of time there. I spend a lot of time at work, you know, but, like, the people I work with are wonderful people, but it's not what I hinge my, like, social life on. You know, they're not people I really spend time with or wonder about. They, you know, they only wonder about me to whatever extent they do, you know? I mean, the kids are, um, we've connected with a lot of other families with trans kids. Um, so, you know, we've been spending a lot of time with them. Um, kids aren't always, you know, the ages don't always sync up perfectly, but it's always like very wet, warm and welcoming and people kind of get where we're coming from. And it's yeah. really been over backwards to help us. You know, they're making whatever friends they're making at school now. Um, and those kids are not going to be, everything in Vermont is so close together, Chris. Like, I can't even tell you how weird it is. Like, literally, we drive through three towns to get to Jeremiah to work seven minutes away. Like, it's just, it's just bizarre. Yeah. So whatever friends they have, they're not losing. Like, they're not leaving anyone behind when they change schools next yeah. year. Yeah. And likewise, when, you know, when when um, the schools change on them, you know, from middle school to high school, same deal. So I think, you know, we're just going to try and diversify our portfolio and just have, just have friends from wherever. I think it's going to be fine. I think yeah. it'll be okay. And all their friends back in Texas, because they really, the pandemic hit really hard. I mean, we had to really self-limit in Texas. There weren't um, mandates and restrictions and whatever there. And so if you wanted to stay safe and you wanted to stay healthy and you didn't want to be part of the problem, you just stayed home. Right. And so we just stayed home. You know, our kids, um, we elected to put our kids in virtual school for several years. You know, whatever, like a year and two halves, <laughs> right? Um, and so they really mastered the art of being internet friends with their real friends you know they didn't see their real friends for a long time they've been playing messenger playing minecraft on messenger with their with their buddy across the street for years and now their buddies across the country and they're still doing the same thing they did back home so one of the know. benefits of the whole covid thing is we're realizing how how much of the past setup yeah on how we communicate and how we work with each other is just not necessary no the the whole office crisis thing we've got yeah. these huge office buildings throughout and vermont doesn't have very many but mm -hmm. in the big cities that are empty yeah, yeah. right i mean and, yeah. And they're not needed <laughs> right this entire commuter system mm -hmm. that we had not really needed no. for a lot of what we're right. doing yeah. so that's an interesting interesting development as well um in vermont mm -hmm. There, you have not had any kind of um, issues questioning being parents of a trans kid, or have you run into anything? I know that you've, you're affiliated with Outright Vermont. I want to yeah. give them a shout out. God, they're amazing. Um, yeah. 
great group of people yeah. and they, they've helped us mm -hmm. in our family mm -hmm. with our our coming mm -hmm. uh, dealing with and, and understanding and providing support and care for our transgender son mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about about how how the support system here in Vermont has, has worked for you or not worked um, when we first got here, um, and we were still camping at various campsites, there were Mostly like... Mostly your yard. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, in more rural areas, uh, you know, just like Texas, the further away from a met metropolitan area you get, the more conservative it became. And there, were, there weren't any, like, times where I was worried um, for our safety, but there were times where it was like, uh, maybe don't talk to those people. Yeah. Um, you know, we were at a campground in Salisbury and this guy was walking around in Confederate flag swimming trunks and I was like, it's like a double traitor. Like it's bad enough, yeah, but like, also you're from the North. <laughs> like, yeah. It's so weird. It was just, it was just strange. So yeah. like, you know, like I was, I didn't feel as on edge as, um, I did back home, but I was definitely like, you know has been beat into the back of my head uh did i say cautious has been mm -hmm. caution has been <laughs> anyways um but since we've been settled in uh chittenden county like um most of those words have gone away um and you know we've made a lot of great connections through outright vermont mm -hmm. um and other newcomers too yeah you know other families that are leaving their states um, I connected with somebody on Facebook yesterday who's coming not from Texas, you know, who's planning a move to this area, next, mm -hmm. I guess, in the summer. Yeah. Um, so I'm super, super grateful for the existing community here and how welcoming and supportive they've been. Because we were on the parent calls through Outright Vermont uh, back home when we were, like, trying to figure out where we wanted to escape to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because we, I mean, we had never met a Vermonter. You know, we, we had never even yeah. been, been a here. A real Vermonter right? or never, a flat, never. flatlander acting. Right. So now you guys are yeah. getting the nomenclature. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Fat, flatlander yeah. and real Vermonter. Yeah. Um, and just knowing that there was already a community that existed and how welcoming they were on those calls um, put my mind at ease a lot. Yeah. Um, just like deeply empath empathetic, you know, like really, really hurting for us in ways that I don't really know how to phrase it because it's kind of in ways that Texans don't. But even even people in our situation, you know, there, there's another family from Texas who who left um, that I've been spending time with. And it's it's kind of nice to just sit and talk shit about Greg Abbott and not not feel the full weight, you know, not not go to, like, the full depths of everything we've been through, but just be like, yeah, like, you know, fuck that guy. I mean, that's how it is in Austin all the time, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of nice to just go back there and be like, yeah, he's the worst, you know? Like, it sucks, <laughs> sucks to be us, you know? Um, you, I mean, the, the folks here care so deeply and want so badly for us to be okay. Yeah, like, we've had, you know, you know friends, like, take us shopping. <laughs> For winter clothes, teach, because teach we us have about mittens. yeah, because we you know we literally have yeah. no idea no. how to handle negative ten degree weather. No. Um, but, you know now we do yeah. sort of. We yeah. haven't experienced it yet, but you know like I feel like we're much more prepared than you know our hoodies that we wore back home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the winter coats we bought the kids last Christmas. Yeah. That are like which are good for like November. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it's like good for apple picking here. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, um, thank you guys for taking the time out to sit and chat with me about your experience. It's fascinating to me, just as a, a liberal-minded kind of person, that uh, that your story exists at all. Yeah. Um, thank that, you. That thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> that there that there is a place in within the contiguous uh, American states, and I knew this intellectually, but not emotionally. Yeah. Right? I yeah. didn't I didn't know anybody who is going through what you guys have gone through. Um, I'm very very glad that you guys have landed well, mm -hmm. and uh, I look forward to you know knowing you guys in the future and and eating delicious 
pickles. And <laughs> Bar- barbecue. Um, right, exactly. Chili. Well, when we get when we get to the summer next yeah. year, we'll have to have a, a real Texas barbecue. We will. We'll have a yard yeah. next summer. We'll have yeah, everybody yeah. over. Yeah. And we'll have to come over. And, we'll have a we'll have a hoot nanny. Uh, a hoot nanny. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's not a thing. Did you make that say. up? <laughs> that only exists in songs. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I look forward to our uh, you know our future here. It's, yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah. Great. Couldn't have done it without y'all. We're happy to be a part of the journey. And indeed, we are happy to be part of your journey of humanist being. When Humanists Attack is produced by Roger Kimmel Smith, Chris West, and Vincent Downing, and edited by Roger. Many thanks to Aidan King and Garrett A. Theme music is by Eric Bode. Find us at thehumanistbeing.org and also on Meetup and Discord.